Hi everyone, my name is Ones Friedman. I'm an IT professional and a science fiction writer. Welcome to Science Sci-Fi, connecting the public to science and technology through storytelling. Today, we're going to compare Mars to O'Neill's colonies. O'Neill colonies or O'Neill cylinders, those are huge space stations, uh, rotating space stations with artificial gravity and air in them. We'll talk about them later. And Mars, we already had a few videos talking about Mars. Uh, so we are going to run quickly through it and do primarily the points that are comparing Mars to O'Neill cylinders. Stay tuned, we're gonna have lots of fun. Mars, what can I say? It's on the roadmaps, everybody looking at it. Mars is currently championed by NASA and SpaceX. Elon Musk and SpaceX, this is the primary goal. This is what they want to do. This is why Elon established the company. He wants to colonize Mars to build a huge sp spacecraft uh, called Starship that will go and carry payload and people to Mars and establish a first mission and then an outpost and then a colony and a city on Mars. This is his goal. This is what he wants to do with SpaceX. In the latest interview that I heard him about two weeks ago, he said that he plans an uncrew mission to Mars by 2024 and land the first people on Mars by 2026. This is not a hard scheduled time set. Uh, there could be some deviation because the spacecraft is still in development and they may be delayed. But this is the goal. This is what he, this is what he wants to do. NASA, on the other hand, has plan for themselves to go to Mars. Initially, the idea is going to the moon. They want to prepare and see how the technology, how it's done on the moon. The reason they want to start the moon is because the moon is close, of, close by, it's only three days away from Earth. And you can test the technology and if something is wrong, you can send another supply mission and uh, rescue missions. Mars, the launch window is only once every two years and they take six months to go there and six months to come back. So NASA wants to go first to the moon in 2024, maybe slightly later, but sometimes in the 2030s, they plan to go to Mars using the SLS and the Orion capsule. They're also talking to help them about uh, developing new nuclear propulsion that can make the journey to Mars faster. And also China wants to go to Mars. China plans a crew mission to Mars sometimes in the 2030s or 2040s. We don't know exactly when. Mars. Mars is the most explored planet. We already talked about it in previous videos that are going to put in the links below and also at the end of this presentation. Uh, we had 63 missions to Mars up to date. Uh, a little bit more than a third of them were actually successful. A lot of the landing attempts failed, but, uh, and also there is a continuous mission on Mars since 2004. There has always been at least one or more than one rovers driving around Mars and also orbiters that are taking photos of Mars. Mars, the big advantage, especially when comparing to O'Neill cylinders, is the cost. We need to launch thousands of tons to space in order to get to Mars and have enough, materi enough materials and components and people to start a small colony. So a few thousand tons sounds, maybe even tens of thousands of tons, sounds like a lot, but when you're talking about something like O'Neill uh, cylinder, and, and we'll elaborate later, we're talking about billions of tons. So way, that's way, way, way smaller and way, way, way cheaper. Also, the technology to go on a mission to Mars is more or less ready. Like in less than a decade, we were going to have the spacecraft. Uh, we have the spacesuit. We know how to build small habitat that something like the International Space Station that 
people can live on the surface of Mars for a short period of time or longer durations. Uh, we know the, so we have the technology already. Atmosphere is made primarily of CO2. Uh, the pressure is pretty low, about 1% of Earth's pressure, but still we can use the atmosphere to either to use it to create our own atmosphere, to in greenhouses, to plants like CO2, and also to make uh, rocket fuels. Um, Mars is more interesting in terms of science. There it has geology, and uh, there may even be life there, or Mars may have had life in the past. So we are doing maybe finding fossils, maybe find bacterial life. It's much more interesting than just going to some place in space and build a st space station there and not in terms of science. Uh, engineering is a different matter, but in terms of science, science is, uh, Mars is more interesting. Mars has in situ minerals and building materials. We can go to Mars with relatively small amount of payload and then build habitat from the local materials, like we can refine metals or maybe build blocks and buildings from the local uh, sand or local uh, materials. Uh, also, psychologically, we evolved as a species to live on the surface of a planet. So it makes sense for us to go to another planet and live on the surface. And Mars happened to be a planet. And did I mention the cost? The cost is, of course, the big, big, big difference between an O'Neill cylinder and Mars. So here you go. So we are done talking about Mars. We know for NASA you need a few spaceships. It was within the budget of SpaceX and NASA. It can be done within a decade or so. And you don't need something really, really huge. You need something maybe the size of the International Space Station maybe bigger if you want to build a bigger outpost or eventually a city. What is an O'Neill cylinder? We are talking about a completely different beef. The concept proposed by American physicist Gerard K. O'Neill in 1976 in his book, The High Frontier, Human Colonies in Space. We are talking about a rotating space station with artificial gravity. Now, if you don't feel, want to feel as an astronaut or a personal leader, you don't want to feel dizziness, uh, you cannot make it too small. So in order to create artificial gravity, you need to spin it. That's similar when you go to an amusement park to a carousel and you feel pushed against the wall when it spins very fast. This is the idea. It spins very fast and it pushes us or anybody in the space station to the wall and we feel like it's in gravity. Now, you can achieve one G, one Earth gravity, either by having a small station that spins very fast or a large station that spins slow. The problem with spinning very, very fast, it is it called it cause dizziness and disorientation because of uh, various forces like Coriolis forces and others. So in order to feel comfortable, it needs to be big. So the regular design, we're talking about something with diameter of one kilometer. That means that the spin is one kilometer. I try to remember how many times it spins per minute. Maybe I'll do that later. Uh, but the length is something like 10 kilometer long. So we are talking about a cylinder that rotates around itself to create artificial gravity. That is one kilometer in diameter and 10 kilometer wide. Of course, you also need energy source. And this is a very massive construction in space. It's probably going to weight something like a billion ton, uh, perhaps even more. And it's huge. So it's ain't gonna be cheap, it ain't gonna be done immediately. O'Neill colonies or O'Neill cylinders are endorsed by Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos from Amazon. Uh, he said in May 9, uh, 2019, he proposed that building an O'Neill cylinder colonies rather than 
colonizing other planets is a better alternative. Why? On Mars, first of all, there is a limit to the number of people you can put there. Uh, I don't know how big a city on Mars, maybe a million people. You cannot have as many people as on Earth. It's a smaller planet. It doesn't have the proper environment. Gravity on Mars is about 38% of Earth's gravity. So this is something not optimal for human biology. Mars have a uh, radiation either from the sun or from interstellar space. Uh, Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. Uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, in his comparison, he said that, why don't we be the colony on the top of Mount Everest? It's much, much more convenient than Mars. Uh, so his proposal is to build this large space station, huge space station with artificial gravity. So it's going to be the atmosphere is going to be perfect, like one atmospheric pressure, like 14 bar, like you have it here in sea level. The gravity, we can put whatever we want. So we're going to put it at 1G, like on Earth. Uh, atmospheric pressure we already talked about. Temperature, we're going to control it. So instead of being an average temperature of minus 63 Celsius, we're going to put it at minus 20, uh, sorry, plus 20. I won't want to live in minus 20, at plus 20. Something very convenient for the human body. Also, we can have billion people living in millions of space stations. So there is no limit. Again, the main problem is price. But in terms of our physiology, uh, what we want, it's a much, much better much more convenient solution than living on a small planet with low gravity, high radiation, low atmosphere, cold, not suitable for us entirely. So the O'Neill advantages, we already spoke about many of them. First of all, we control the gravity. We can put it like Mars, like the moon, like Earth. We can put whatever we want. Likely it's going to be 1G because this is what is best for our health. We control the temperature, we control the atmosphere. Uh, it's more efficient material. For example, if you take Mars, it has a 6.39 uh, times 10 in the power of 23 kilograms. That means, and we only can only use the surface. Like if you, we, we don't going to live very, very deep in millions of, Floors. We are just going to be on the surface, perhaps in a lab tube below the surface, but more or less, we don't have too much real estate. And as we go deeper, uh, gravity is going to become even lower. Now, uh, the asteroid belt has much, much less mass than Mars, perhaps 1% of that. But the material in the asteroid belt could be sufficient to construct hundreds of millions of O'Neill colonies. And if we take Mars apart, we can have trillions of colonies. I don't know, a very large number. So just the asteroid belt, we can build millions of O'Neill cylinder. Let's say in each O'Neill cylinder, 10,000 people can live. Uh, so hundreds of millions of that time 10,000, we are talking about a population of uh, trillions. That's a very large population, a lot more than what we can have on Mars or even on Earth. And that's just from using materials from the asteroid belt. What if we use material from the Cooper belt or other asteroid or the old cloud or maybe break away a moon or something like that? I don't know if you can do that. but. The sky is the limit. Um, so the, it's going to support just our solar system. You, I don't know if you're, you know the concept of Dyson sphere. So this is not exactly a Dyson sphere, but we can have of a swarm, swarm of millions of tens of millions of O'Neill colonies all around the solar system that can use solar energy or maybe nuclear energy. Another advantage of O'Neill Cylinders is going interstellar. 
the number of advantages, including we can use interstellar generation shift to travel. There are different method, theoretical method to travel to other star system. One with suspended animation or maybe some kind of formal, some of technology that is faster than light. Uh, but one of the concept is the generation ship. Uh, the concept is you take a very, very large ship that has its own habitat, like O'Neill Cylinder, for example, and then send thousands of people or 10,000 of people that will just travel for many decades or maybe even hundreds of years and live their life on the voyage and then eventually come to a new star system. So suppose this starship can reach 5% of the speed of light. It, it is theoretically possible if you use fusion power. Um, so fi or maybe even Orion, that's a nuclear bombs. Uh, but let's say we can get to 5% the speed of light. A generation ship can reach Alpha Proxima, that's the nearest star system, in about 100 years. So that's maybe four generations, uh, maybe there are advanced medical solution, so people can live longer than 100 years, so it could maybe be done in the lifespans of a very healthy person, uh, assuming some other medical enhancement that do not exist to, today, but may exist in a few decades. Uh, so when we come to a new solar system, we don't need a planet like Earth in order to live there because we have an O'Neill cylinder and maybe it has asteroids and we can build more O'Neill cylinders over there. So this is going to be an excellent way to travel to other star systems and colonize other star system in a, even if, if they don't have an Earth-like planets with oxygen and water and everything with that liquid oxygen, everything that we need here on, on our star system. And now the painful part, the cost of an O'Neill cylinder. Uh, we can do a few concepts. First, we can build one in orbit around Earth using materials launched from Earth. We're talking about billions of ton or maybe one billion ton to space. And uh, right now it costs $10,000 to launch one kilogram. So we're talking about one billion ton, that's 100, uh, 1,000 billion kilogram time 10,000. I don't even know how many zeros is it, but it's a few thousand times more expensive than colonizing Mars. And now we do expect launch costs to drop down and maybe in the far future, we will have something called a space elevator that will reduce the cost of bringing payload or materials to space from Earth at a much, much lower co cost. Uh, but that's uh, how we can build something like on a little cylinder in an orbit, in an Earth orbit. We can also build one in the asteroid, as I proposed earlier. Uh, use materials from the asteroid. A lot of asteroids are made of primarily of uh, iron and nickel. You can use those to build the, the body or the huge body that is one kilometer diameter, 10 kilometers wide, spinning around itself. But for that, we need to have, not even improve, but to have an asteroid mining technologies. It will be many decades before such technology will be available. So I would say, although an on ill cylinder, and it's a really good idea that is much better than colonizing Mars in terms of our physiology and the number of people and support and how convenient it's going to be. This is a project that's going to take a lot longer time to be fulfilled and also it's going to cost a lot more funding to achieve. Now to, for the fun part we've all been waiting for, science fiction. Mars colony in science fiction. 
Uh, to the left, we have, of course, the Expanse uh, TV series and also a series of books by James S. A. Corey, who is actually two people. That's his pen name, but it's actually two people. One is a writer, Daniel Abrams, and a game developer. Uh, so the Expanse, either watch the TV series, it's on uh, Amazon Prime, and also there is a series of books. I believe there are something like 12 or 13 books already came out. Uh, the picture to the right is the Martian. That one is both a movie and a book, a book by Andy Weir. Very recommended about survival on Mars of the first mission. Uh, to the right, that's of course Arnold Schwarzenegger in Total Recall, based on a short story by Philip K. D. called we can remember it for you wholesale. Um, that's a very good movie from the 1990s. And to the left, we see Mars from National Geographic. It's a TV series. There's been two seasons in this about the first Mars mission and then the initial construction of the first Mars colony or Mars city. And also it's also some conflict between government enterprise and private sexual sectors that are for profit. It's an interesting, it's kind of a hybrid between documentary and science fiction. Uh, still recommended. Let's go to O'Neill Cylinder science in science fiction. To the top, of course, that's Babylon 5, the TV series from the 1990s. Uh, to the bottom left, Elysium movies from 2013 and to the right again the expanse uh, we talked about it earlier when we spoke about mars now we talk about it when we talk about O'Neill cylinders uh, that one is O'Neill cylinder it's called behemoth it belonged to the belters in the asteroid belt it it's, use, it's also a spacecraft, so it could be a generation ship that goes to another star system. Um, or, but it was built in the asteroid belt, and it's in O'Neill Cylinder. More movies is Interstellar to the right. Uh, if you remember the Cooper Station, uh, the, the old movie, they tried to build some, to launch it from Earth, and they needed to find some formulas about how to manipulate gravity. That was the only way for humanity to survive other than take some embryos and go to other star systems in, through a wormhole. This was the plan B on how to survive some of the, uh, to make some of the people of Earth survive. At the end of the mission, the movie, they were successful to bring it to space. And to the left, we have Arthur C. Clarke's book, Rendezvous with Rama. I wish there was a movie or a TV series about it. It's about an alien artifact that come to Earth and it's basically non air cylinder and some astronauts are going to investigate it. So the conclusion, what is better, a non air cylinder or colonizing Mars? I think that for the short term, Mars is preferable just because of the cost and the readiness of the technology. But in the long run, we do want to have O'Neill cylinders and plenty of O'Neill colonies and go there. Of course, that will take many more decades and a lot more money. And we need to be more specialized and have the knowledge on how to mine the asteroid and manipulate matter and build large constructions in space. So Mars first and then O'Neill cylinders, which is the better solution, but slower. Did you like the video? Don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button and see you next week.